So yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm a graduate student, Michael Dickinson's lab, and I, uh, I'm going to talk to you about like behavior of animals using machine learning as a tool to understand behavior because, um, yeah, of course, behavior is so important in a neuroscience uh, perspective as well. Um, and isolating what behavior you want to study. Um, uh, yeah, of course, you use a neuroscience and your domain knowledge of the particular animal of choice, and then machine learning and some other tools just enable you to um, uh, do this in a more like scale up while analyzing this behavior. So I took the liberty of changing the title of the slides from understanding behavior to analyzing behavior using machine learning, because that's what I think we're really doing. Uh, and the understanding is more um, on the side of the scientist of what that means. Um, so initially I wanted to um, just talk about what is behavior, but that's like a loaded question. So I'm just going to show you some examples of cool behavior and hopefully the audio comes through. Dancing can be found all over the animal world. Displays of grace and strength are often used to attract mates or intimidate competitors. But in honeybees, the waggle dance is so much more than self-promotion. Imagine that you're a bee flying out to find a food source and you keep going there and coming back. If you were to draw a little map of that, you would see this portion, which is mostly straight, going out to the food source and then curving to come back, going out to the food source, curving to come back. Essentially, that's what the waggle dance is. It's a miniature map of where the bee goes. The waggle dance contains three critical pieces of information. The direction of the waggle gives the direction of the food source. The duration of the waggle indicates how far away the food is and the repetition of the whole dance indicates how good the food source is. The more so, um, yeah, of course, there's uh, I study insects and, and uh, fruit flies and, and um, soon ants. So uh, one group of animals that I'm super passionate about are insects and they're like amazing behaviors that insects do, but there are not these like nice short videos made. Um, so I was able to find one of this bee waggle dance, which maybe people have heard about before. But the point of this is just to show that behavior can be um, just across scales, right? Like you're looking inside a beehive at a really short uh, time frame as well, like 250 milliseconds. And you're focusing on this one bee as compared to all these other bees. So you can already see the challenges from a machine learning perspective and tracking this bee and like tracking the, but you can see how valuable this can be. Um, uh, no pun intended. Um, and then on the other end of the scale, both spatially and temporally, is the uh, this video of, of uh, Mbari, where I'm currently interning, of deep sea animals. So I'll let this play for a little bit as well. You might think that the world's largest animal migration takes place on land, but in reality, it takes place in the ocean every single night. Millions of animals are moving tremendous distances from the deep sea up to the surface at night to feed. It's this constant process of moving up and down through the water as the sun is going up and down. Right when the sun goes down, deep sea animals come up to the surface, which is amazing. They're coming to where we can see them with our own eyes. We don't need any advanced robotics to go down and search for them. We can actually go scuba diving and find them. So yeah, those were just some cool examples of animals and, and cool behaviors um, across both times and scales, just because we are talking about behavior and why not start with some cool animal behaviors. And um, just to also um, kind of show uh, or like elucidate the fact that something like a migration, right? Like a deep sea uh, animals coming up to the surface to feed and then going down. So just detecting animals, like whether animals are present or absent is also, can also be treated as a behavior because it's, um, yeah, it is an animal present at this time of day and like uh, when they're most present and stuff like that. So behavior doesn't necessarily have to be the typical, um, what one thinks about when we say behavior is like, I don't know, like a mouse in a lab, like, and you're doing some sort of like point tracking and trying to figure out what exactly this mouse is doing. But um, yeah, I just, I'm just giving you these examples to think of behavior at, at a much broader scale as well, um, from one species to like multiple species. So um, of course there's like 
lots to cover on this topic uh, on machine learning and behavior. And um, it's only a one hour talk. So um, I'm going to try to, um, the first part of the talk, I'm gonna just talk about general machine learning applied to uh, uh, animal behavior and kind of just general rules for um, a good machine learning um, approach um, and give you some kind of uh, takeaways. And then the second part, we're gonna focus a little bit on like one specific tool, which is like deep lab cut. Um, and then, um, yeah, I, I do have resources on the slide deck for um, links about Deep Lab Cut. So um, I think there is a lot of value in me conveying these like general kind of machine learning uh, ideas and takeaways as well, especially if, if one hasn't used machine learning, there's just so many moving parts and variables like, oh, like what data set should I use? What model should I use and stuff like that. So hopefully these guidelines will help make that general process easier um, irrespective of whether the approach is deep lab cut or could be anything else. So um, in this concept of um, uh, this domain of machine learning for behavior, one of the main advantages obviously is that you can do a lot of um, automated analysis. So once you define your behavior and once you define that, okay, like these are the sets of movement patterns I'm looking for, you can just train a model and run that um, one doesn't have to like sit and watch a video of an animal and kind of try to infer this themselves where they can automate this process and just let this run in parallel or multiple animals and uh, just let it run overnight and do the analysis uh, themselves. And then also in some cases, um, you might have the ability to do things that are uh, with these models that are really hard for humans. For example, um, for whales, right, for recognition of whales, People use um, for recognize the recognizing the identity of certain whales. People use the um, uh, the marks on the whale tail, like when the whale breaches and the tail comes out. You can kind of see the patterns of damage on the whale tail, and people kind of use that as a uh, proxy for identity. If if one whale has like a big scar on it, uh, same thing is done for elephant ears as well. So, uh, I mean, of course, humans have come up with these heuristics by observing these animals and, and being able to say that, oh, okay, I've seen this whale before because it has this scar in a certain region. But now that you know this information, you can incorporate this into a machine learning model and have this just run constantly over time in a camera like for 24 seven. So it allows you uh, the ability to scale up your analyses. And um, as we'll see in one scenario, which I'll talk about later, ants, you can see that these models don't necessarily work as um, as one would think uh, intuitively based on human vision. Um, so I've kind of split it up into behavior in the lab and behavior in the field and uh, kind of talk about like little tidbits of information uh, in both these realms. So one example of uh, behavior, this is a video that I took in my lab um, doing an experiment, is a fruit fly that's tethered and um, the fly, this is in the experimental um, protocol. So some experiment is happening while the fly is flying and we are measuring the, um, the wing beat amplitudes. So just the left and right wing is these little gray edges. And you don't actually need machine learning for this. And we don't use machine learning for this because it's just a simple edge detector can kind of tell you the angle and then you can translate that to amplitude. Goes to show that, yeah, of course you don't, you shouldn't just apply machine learning uh, blindly, but only when cases are needed. For tracking the head though, it's a little bit more tricky and our um, uh, our uh, head tracker, which doesn't use machine learning, wasn't working so well. So I decided to use uh, Deep Lab Cut, which I'll talk about more, but basically Deep Lab Cut is just this um, algorithm that allows you to track the pose of animals. So it allows you to say, okay, I wanna track certain points that you label, and then the model will then uh, learn um, how to track those points and keep a track of those points. So it's very useful in this case, I'm measuring the head yaw by, um, you can track these two points on either side of the head and the head yaw is just how much it tilts in this plane. Um, so I did this and it works fine to measure the head yaw angle. But when I was looking at this uh, video, I was like, there is, you can see clearly that the fly is not only turning its head in yaw, but it's also, it's turning its head in all three uh, dimensions, right? It's pitching, moving forward and backward, and as well as it's rolling. So one side of the head is moving into the plane and the other side is moving out, um, it's typical roll motion. And I was like, oh, can we use, although we don't have 3D information, we just have this one camera, can we uh, try to infer 3D head position from this one view? 
And from a physics point of view, you would think that, well, that's not just not a good framing of the problem, right? To try to infer 3D from one view. But I went ahead and, and tried this approach, um, which involved kind of taking, uh, making this 3D head model, which is based on some scans that I took uh, online and then kind, uh, kind of shaped it a little bit in Blender. And then I positioned this 3D um, model in Blender at different angles and kind of like projected this as what a camera from um, when placed behind what the camera would see like. And you get this data uh, data set of um, projections of this. Thing. And then now since it's a model and you're setting the head position, you know exactly the three-dimensional um, head, uh, the yaw pitch and roll of the, the head. So my idea was that, okay, now that we have this artificial data set, can we try to like learn to predict 3D views um, starting with this data set? And then hopefully this works in the real scenario as well when applied to a real fly. And um, you can see in these images that I, um, on the top row is like images of, of real flies. And the bottom row, they are real flies, but I've done some simple kind of like thresholding and stuff to make them look um, as close as possible to the um, rendered versions that I showed you in the previous slide. Um, because of course you want your uh, the data that you're training the model on to look very similar to the data they're actually gonna be testing on. Um, and it does okay, but, um, um, okay, I'll play this video, but it's not really important. The, 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 the fly in, um, on the top is the real fly and, and the fly at the bottom is kind of like the predicted, um, 3d position. And then the model is set to that 3d position. So basically it's trying to, trying to follow the thing on the top. You can kind of see that it does it sometimes it, it was really hard to um, you kind of have to like squint and there's no real like ground truth for this. So we are not able to evaluate because we don't have this information, um, the actual role and uh, pitch of, 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 of the fly. So we don't, there's no way to evaluate this. But then after spending some time working on this, um, I just decided to stick a camera on top of the fly. So this is just a different position. So I had that camera at the back, but now I added an additional camera on the top. And now the view looks like this, like you can, it's it's a much easier task now. And you can see these points are again with uh, drawn with deep lap cut, but now using this view, this is way easier to measure roll because you can kind of uh, just measure from these points, how much the head is, is turning. And also with pitch, you can see their average, how much they go forward and backward. So the, um, um, yeah, so you, one can measure roll like this by measuring the tether and then also the kind of, drawing these two points, fitting a line through it, and kind of just calculating, taking the perpendicular line, and then this would give you the head roll. But my point for all of the, through all of these slides is that um, when possible, consider adding more sensors to make your problem um, easier in, instead of applying machine learning just straight out of the box. Um, you have this domain knowledge, and uh, yeah, if it's possible, try to use additional sensors, um, cameras or microphones in different places, and that'll just make things like much easier. This this is this was this deep lap cut using this view. This I did this in a day, whereas I spent like months trying to work on that 3D model. And then this, of course, was the better approach of just adding a camera. So that's my takeaway message from um, this this work. Is basically, don't just jump straight right in into applying um, machine learning to solve a task that might not be best suited for that view or that task, but consider getting more data and considering adding more sensors. Um, this May is another project. That that? I, sorry? May I ask a question about oh, yeah, that? Go ahead. Now that you have the data with the two cameras, mm -hmm. could you use those that data set to train a decoder that could do the work reliably with just a single sensor? Yeah, yeah. And I had that thought as well of using this as like essentially ground truth and then comparing and seeing how that 3D model does. Um, I haven't done that yet. And uh, for the purposes of uh, the science, when I just wanted to get the head roll angle, I figured that this view is 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 great and this is giving me the head roll angle. So in terms of the science, um, I don't need to have done all of that stuff. Like that in itself could be a separate interesting machine learning project to to get ground truth and see if you can learn 3D view from one view. But um, 
Yeah, yeah, I haven't done that yet. And um, yeah, I think the point I just wanted to make was to use additional sensors when possible um, to assist the machine learning or to make the task simpler. Um, this is another project in that in that vein of um, using um, additional like well one thing you can do apart from additional sensors is additional try to make use of additional data whenever you can to um, try to help your model. So this is a project done by Johan, uh, who was a grad student um, in in Michael's lab and has is now graduated and is working in a startup. So um, this was his, uh, this is a schematic of his, a rendering of his uh, setup where he has three high speed cameras looking at a fly placed in the middle, and he's trying to accurately determine the uh, position of the fly at very high temporal resolution in order to then study uh, a bunch of downstream tasks about the, the muscles and the hinge, and you can read more about it in the preprint that's online. But um, Johan had this uh, software um, built, this GUI, um, where you can look at the three separate views from the three separate cameras of the fly. And um, he, um, in order to best accurately get the position um, of the wing um, and measure all of these parameters about the wing, which is the amount of wing rotation and um, uh, various other, um, the angle of attack and stuff like that, Johan had these um, this fly model built uh, the, these model wings um, basically these rendered um, wings that have a similar like vein structure and um, this is kind of roughly his approach he he took the three different views of the actual fly and and kind of three passed them through three separate layers of of uh, uh, CNN and tried to get the model pose. But, um, and the slide doesn't perfectly depict what I want to say, but um, just bear with me, that basically uh, what Johan found was that if you take these three views and you train a CNN or a model to predict the accurate wing position, it does a fairly decent job, but it's not perfect. And uh, Johan wanted to be, um, he wanted these angles to be really precise because they a small change in angle can result in a large change in um, kinematics. So um, he basically was able to further use the wing vein information to then align the um, machine learning prediction uh, better with the actual wing by matching up the wing veins of the actual fly with the veins of his model fly. Um, and he did this using uh, an approach called particle swarm optimization. So he would use this machine learning model to make an initial prediction and then use this optimization procedure, basically matching the patterns on the uh, the model wing to the actual wing, uh, the wing structure of the actual fly to get his final prediction. And um, yeah, uh, as I said, you can read more about it online, but my point for these slides was just in addition to using extra sensors when possible, make use of additional information. Uh, in this case, the wing vein structure is a clear signal that um, one can use to align, um, to further refine your, your prediction from your machine learning model. So, and, and all of this knowledge, of course, the scientist has, because um, it's your data and you're, you're, you're seeing these videos a lot. So you have all this domain knowledge of like, oh, okay, this extra thing can be useful information to make this prediction. So find ways to incorporate that information and that'll just help make your prediction better. Um, then coming to behavior in the wild, this is an example of, um, this is a video that I took of uh, along with, uh, in Joe's lab with another grad student, Julian. We set up this camera trap at the entrance of an ant nest. Um, so this is a tree and uh, the ants live inside this tree. And um, you can, like from this from this paused frame, you can kind of see that there are some ants. Like you can see them along this edge over here, and maybe some over here. The ants are kind of a similar brownish color to the tree themselves. But when I play this video, you can see you notice a lot more ants because they're moving and they're like easy to see now. As compared to like when I pause a frame, it's kind of almost like the ants have like almost disappeared to some extent. And you can just see them much more easily when you play the play the video. Um, so this kind of a machine learning model trained to detect the ants given one frame can actually do really well in finding all, all of the ants in that single frame. 
Um, so this kind of goes to uh, elucidate my point of what I was trying to say earlier, where a machine learning model might not intuitively, uh, might not work as we intuitively think. The cues that are good for human vision might not necessarily be the best cues also for a model. I mean, sure, motion information, uh, adding in motion information to the machine learning model wouldn't hurt suddenly, but the fact that it can it can work decently well, even given a single frame, is pretty interesting and kind of speaks to the point that these models um, can notice subtle patterns in the data, uh, which are fine grained, which might not be very obvious to the human eye unless there are other cues such as motion. So um, uh, yeah, and then this is kind of like some results of uh, detection and tracking of these ants. So you can see that kind of it does a very good job in maintaining identity um, and tracks these for fairly uh, long sequences. Um, so you can do things such as track the ants across various times of day, and you can see the ant activity kind of like decreases um, around between 10 and 11 a.m. quite drastically. And um, we're still working on this kind of extending this to uh, trying to collect data at night using infrared cameras. Um, but yeah, this is another example of how machine learning can help you learn things about this ant for about which we know very little, even the um, whether it's nocturnal or crepuscular, um, stuff like that, the activity, whether other insects are coming in, interacting with this ant, a lot of stuff just by tracking um, uh, animals of interest using machine learning. Um, this picture was these two snapshots were taken on the same day at different time points. Um, and I'm, I, I have this here just to show you the, uh, when working in the wild, the challenges that um, a computer vision problem has to, computer vision model has to deal with, which is extreme changes in lighting. And um, for, for a human, this might not matter so much. If you if know what an ant looks like, this orangish thing, we can certainly find it in an unseen uh, lighting conditions. But this is really hard when you think of each image just being a set of pixels. And then um, because there's a change in lighting conditions, literally every single pixel value is different. So these are some of the, um, and I'll talk more about this in the next few slides, but some of the things that you want to consider when you're um, selecting or you're making your training set for your machine learning models is that you want to encompass all sources of variation. If a model was only trained in this lighting and then you apply it to this unseen lighting, it's not going to do very well because this uh, distribution shift is just way too much for, for the model. So with that, I come to some general um, computer uh, machine learning computer vision guidelines, starting with the first and kind of being very important as well, like how you create your uh, train, while and test split. So you must have, um, yeah, um, these are just kind of, you're taking your data and separating it into smaller splits. One large chunk of your data, usually um, 70 to 80% you're using for training your model. And then the other two validation and the test set you're, uh, you're leaving out to um, test the model and then also to choose the best model. So uh, to elucidate that, this is just some slides I took from Sarah. Um, so imagine you have these two classes and uh, of, of data points plotted on this like two-dimensional plane. And um, you uh, using this data, you learn this like linear classifier can separate, you uh, think it does quite well. And in order to test how it works is you leave, you can leave some, you can pretend that you don't have some of your data, which is what I was saying. You leave some of it out of the training set as a test set or a validation set. And um, you want to test using that. So let's say you leave these uh, few examples out and then you use the rest for training. And then you, uh, you so use these for training and using these left out examples, you kind of then test this train model and say um, um, how well it's done. But of course, just using the training data, there could have been many possible scenarios of learning different classifiers, uh, which do equally well in separating your data. And how do you know which one to pick? Using your, uh, you can evaluate, you can assess that using your left out data. Um, and uh, the not all of the models will work well for this left out data. So since this data, you're, you're comparing various different models on this left out data as well. Uh, to kind of pick the best models, it's not actually left out. 
So um, you're 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 kind of contaminating your analysis because you're still referencing this data in choosing your model. So hence we that's why we have these three splits as opposed to just two splits as opposed to just a training set and a test set. Um, you have the training set, validation set, and a test set. So you use the validation set to do this model selection um, after you're done training. And um, once you've picked, once you've decided, okay, based on the validation set, okay, I found this like one line that does really well um, on the training set and also on the validation set, then you don't change your model um, and you test your model on this like unseen test set that it's never seen before. And those are your metrics. You, you, you should not use your test set to then further refine your, um, uh, your model and then try to tweak it so that it best works only for that test set because all of these splits are just examples of data in some broader unseen distribution. Uh, so the best way to do this is to um, um, have this validation set to in order to do your model selection and your parameter tuning and stuff like that. And then you, um, um, if you want to try different models, again, you try it on the training set and the validation set. And then the test set should be just completely unseen and uh, just for your final kind of um, reporting the uh, values of your model. And uh, um, yeah, just to, just to keep it fair. So um, in creating this, uh, so you definitely want to think a lot about the uh, train test, uh, train validation and test splits. Uh, usually people do, um, I don't know, 70%, 15, 15, or 80, 10, 10, uh, something of that scale for train, val, and test. And um, apart from just the percentages, you also want to take into account um, what your end goal is. Um, so, um, for example, you could have a case where you've collected lots and lots of videos of, of uh, let's say, mice doing some behavior in your lab. And you don't really, you just want your aim for your machine learning model is to analyze that data. And you don't care about new conditions and unseen data. You just want to get through this data set. You've collected this data set over the last five years and you just want to analyze it. So in that case, I know uh, you guys had a lecture on overfitting. So in that case, overfitting is not a bad thing. You're, you're, you're learning things within this distribution and you're not expecting this distribution to change because you just want to analyze your data set. Um, as opposed to the scenario where you want to make a general model, um, which works well on your data, but can also give in a new data set, um, uh, work well on that. Like if you're trying a new, um, if you're collecting data every day and you, and you want to, um, you make some changes, you try a new species or, or something like that, and you want it to work out of the box for these, uh, unseen conditions then those are separate aims. And, and this kind of informs also how you make your train test splits. And then another thing you want to think about is your valuation metrics. Um, you could have a highly imbalanced data set. Like if you were, if you were training a classifier to distinguish between dogs and cats and 90% of your data is just images of dogs. Even if the classifier just is 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 not really a trained classifier, but it just says dog for everything that you give it, you're still going to have 90% accuracy if you just look at accuracy as a metric. So you want to think about what um, evaluation metric uh, best is best suited for your task. And that depends on um, um, uh, whether you have class imbalance, or you could use something like balanced accuracy, which is a very kind of, you can compute the accuracy per class separately, and then you take the average of those two, uh, giving equal importance to every class. And you can also look at like precision and recall because in certain cases, a false positive is not as um, detrimental as a miss. Um, so yeah, you, you you can read more about different evaluation metrics, but you want to think about this um, um, before you start start about your your task um, because um, yeah, evaluation metric is how you how you're going to evaluate your model. So that has to make sense for the data you're trying to um, analyze. And the problem you're trying to solve, and as I said earlier, you want to try to cover um, all sources of variation. So in this ant data, for example, I would take some frames because I want it to work throughout the day. I, I'll take some frames from from the morning, some frames from the afternoon, some frames from the evening, and put those all in my training set. 
so my uh, I want my model to have seen these various conditions. Um, and um, because I know if it sees something completely different, it's just not going to work very well. So I want to cover um, all uh, sources of variation that I can think of, which includes also the camera location. Like if I take the same camera that I've trained to work on this uh, tree detecting ants, and if I take that and move it to a different tree uh, without any training data, it's probably not going to work very well. So um, these machine learning models do not so well at these large changes in distribution. And um, that's kind of one of the, the the takeaways that this domain transfer, and that includes also going from uh, synthetic generated data, like on Blender to like real data, even though you can try to spend a lot of time in trying to make those look as similar as possible, they don't really work as well when you're shifting domains completely. Um, of course, they work very well. Like if I have a model train on ants for one tree, it works well on that tree. And then I move it to a different tree. And then I annotate some more frames from that new condition. I incorporate some training data from this new domain. Then, then it'll go back to working well. But when given a completely unseen um, uh, domain uh, shift, these networks don't really work that well. And this is a whole separate um, uh, area of research in machine learning, how to handle this like domain transfer. And of course, it's, it's not solved and people are still working on it. Um, and then you have some of these other challenges when working in the real world, detecting animals, uh, animal behavior in the real world, which most often you will see the long tail problem, whereas like certain species of animals will only be seen like five or six times, where certain other species will be seen loads and loads of times. You have this like long tail in your distribution, in your data, and you have this open world. You can come across an animal that you've never seen before. And now your model, instead of binning it into the classes that it was trained on, it has to somehow say that, okay, this is a new animal. I've never seen this before and say that. And then you have to handle motion blur, the ants moving around and occlusions, animals hiding behind objects. So um, yeah. And um, things such as like encompassing lighting conditions can also be applied to lab conditions as well. This is not only to the field. Um, if you're doing analysis, usually we try to uh, experiments, usually we try to maintain the lighting conditions to be constant. But um, if you're seeing that there's certain bursts of activity in your animal at certain times of day, um, then you certainly want to uh, keep this in mind when sampling, as opposed to just uniformly sampling a video and taking um, random frames for your train validation and test, you want to try to think about these things. Uh, to cover source of variation when you're creating these um, these splits. Um, so coming to like some more takeaways, the architecture, including the hyperparameters, they don't really matter that much. Um, and it's very easy to get bogged down in details, in, especially in this field, where there's just so many new papers coming out every day. It's like, oh, should I use a ResNet? Should I use an efficient net? And I'm sure like if you go to Google Scholar and you type whatever problem um, that you're trying to solve and machine learning, there'll just be loads and loads of papers and different approaches. So of course, these architectures have um, differences in, in, in uh, their, uh, their structure and their results and stuff. But usually if you're analyzing data, um, your, your lab data doesn't really matter. Uh, I have a list of standard kind of um, models and uh, the approaches in the next slide, uh, which are a good places to start. And um, yeah, switching architecture doesn't really make that much of a difference. Like, yeah, these new architectures are published with the perspective of research in mind. So they are kind of looking at these standard data sets like ImageNet and they're trying to be like, okay, we made this new change and we got a 1% improvement in ImageNet. For, from a science perspective, that might not matter uh, at all or might not matter that much if you're increasing your your uh, accuracy of your model from like, nine, uh, from like I don't know, 80% to 81% doesn't matter that much. So what's more important is actually this train val and test split because you want to think about, you want to spend a lot of time in making these splits and you want to you want your test set to have uh, to be a fair representation of, of how your model is going to work, right? An example is like if you're if I'm uh, if my aim is to make this uh, ant detector and I want it to be a general ant detector, such that I don't have to train a new one for every um, uh, new ant nest that I take this camera to. So one thing I could do is collect data from let's say four ant nests, and then I could leave one of these ant nests completely out of 
of of the training split and the validation split, like just totally unseen. And then among the three uh, different ant nests, uh, then I can split frames across each of them in the training set and the validation set. And then one of my testing conditions would be, okay, since I want to test how well this uh, model will do in unseen conditions, that's why I've left this um, camera trap completely out of the picture as well to see how well it's going to, or how badly it's going to do when uh, it's given a new uh, location or, or a new timing condition, a new uh, time point. So, um, yeah, I think that's way more important. Domain adaptation doesn't work very well, uh, as I mentioned. And um, yeah, the model is only going to be as good as your uh, annotations and, and your data set, the quality of your data set encompassing these variations and these challenging conditions. Um, um, yeah, so these are some of the um, kind of just a standard um, good places to start off with, depending upon your task. Oh, I forgot to add this one for pixel segmentation, but I will. Um, so deep lab card is good for, um, as we'll, we'll, we'll see for point tracking. Um, if you want to do a uh, bounding box detection, which is what I did for the ants kind of just say, um, where in the frame is the animal and also like what animal that is, uh, then YOLO V8 is a good repository to start with, um, for object tracking the sort, um, object classifier, usually people start off with their own, but I've linked a nice like PyTorch example to, to start off with. And um, yeah, um, I would, these repositories, like including DeepLabCut, they have, um, I don't know, like lots and lots of users every day and a lot of effort and time is being spent in keeping these repositories like up to date, fixing issues that people raise. So um, yeah, that's just one of the kind of general guidelines in using someone's repository on GitHub. You want to see if they have like a decent number of stars on there, a decent number of forks, just to see if this repository is being actively used. And these are some good standard ones to start off with. Um, so um, I have a little bit of time left and um, I can talk a little bit about deep lab cut, which is like one specific case um, of uh, post reduction. Um, but I didn't want to spend too much time on this anyway, because um, as I've linked, there are some, uh, they have provided some really good resources, some guides on, on how to get this to work. And there's, there's just lots of stuff online because this is just, this is being, being, this just came out in 2018 and is being used widely across um, lots of different labs and stuff like that. So I didn't want my lecture to just be me reading out the guide and conveying information that you can just read by yourself. So hopefully some of these other practical tips have been useful and um, kind of helping you kind of like just guide um, how you would solve, uh, how you would approach a machine learning problem and when you would apply machine learning and when not. Um, the deep lab cut, I was playing around with it in, um, um, so this link has like installation instructions for Windows and Mac as well. Um, I was playing around with it uh, uh, last night on uh, my computer, which is uh, Ubuntu 22.04 uh, um, is the operating system. And in that case, I found that you you have to say uh, Python 3.8 when you're installing the, uh, um, when you're creating a Conda environment with the standard Python 3.10, it doesn't seem to work. Um, so um, yeah, uh, this is just installation instructions for Ubuntu uh, 22 and probably previous versions of Ubuntu is fine as well. You, um, so, uh, uh the deep lab part doesn't really work fully off of Colab. Um, they have this, uh, uh, GUI that they've made that lets you, um, select some videos and like do some annotations on it as well. And then, um, you can then, um, save these annotations and then run the training part of it on Colab. So it's kind of like a two part thing. Um, so you would install deep lab cut on your local computer, um, for windows and instructions are in, in this link. This is just creating a conda environment. And then, uh, within that environment, you're just saying pip install deep lab cut with this GUI option and, uh, TensorFlow. And, um, yeah, I can show you how this looks like, but I'm going to switch computers. Okay, so um, yeah, once you've installed your um, uh, Conda, uh, once you've installed pip, uh, pip, pip install deep lab cut inside your Conda environment, you can just go inside it. Um, and then you can just start 
um, deep lab cut by saying Python minus M deep lab cut. And then it, it opens up this, um, this UI. Um, and then you have kind of like step-by-step -step instructions in the guide as well. But this is just to kind of give you a quick um, run through. Um, I can create a new project. Um, let's say deep lab cut test. And um, they have the option of also uh, working for multi-animal. In this case, I'm gonna uh, leave it out because I have a video of a fly. Um, and then you can say browse um, browse files, browse videos to select um, videos that you wanna use for your um, analysis. So I'm gonna select this one fly video. Oops, I think you select the folder. Um, so I think you select the folder and then it shows you the, the videos in that folder. So um, I've selected this one and um, you select that and create, it creates this. And then, um, um, yeah, so what it does is it, it goes ahead and creates a folder on your computer. Um, in this case, you can see the um, location, it's on, on my desktop. Um, so we can just go there. So I've created this folder and it creates all this stuff by default. Um, so this one file config.yaml, you can kind of go inside and, and change things um, such as the body parts. If, if I only wanna say, if I only wanna track two points, uh, let's say fly head up and um, fly neck. And then just do the same thing over here as well. And um, most of these other parameters you don't need to change. Um, they're fine as they are. Um, so save this. And then coming back to the, the, the GUI. Um, so yeah, so uh, you could also just edit it from here, edit config.yaml, I would do the same thing. And you can always add new videos and then um, and then deep lab cut has this, it gives you this option to extract frames. Basically um, it could do, it could do either uniform, which, which, which means that it would just like randomly um, sample various frames from the video, or you could do k-means, um, k-means clustering, which means that it'll, it'll try to find the most distinct frames automatically um, so that you don't have to do this step. And, and, but I would still recommend that you think about it yourself in, in the videos that you're including and you're adding that you wanna try to cover all sources of variation. You wanna include a video from the day, include a video from the night. Um, but you can still use k-means and then extract frames. And yeah, I'm just rushing through this, but um, there are detailed steps on the um, guide um, the link to which is posted. Um, And the number of frames that it's going to extract is also listed in the config file. So you can change that. I think by default, it's set to 20. And it's taking a while because it's, um, because in order to do this k-means thing, if you think about it, it's basically convert, it's going through the entire video, converting every frame into some representation space, and then um, doing this k-means clustering. So it's finding the most unique clusters of frames and then it's selecting 20 frames from that. And that's why it took so much time. If you would have just done uniform, it would have been way faster. So now that that's done, um, it gives you this option to label frames and then it opens up the, 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 the video. Um, and okay, so now it's opened up the video and uh, in the config file, the default was 20 frames per video. So that's why you see only uh, up to zero to 19 at the bottom. These are the various frames that it extracted. And you can um, do the annotations uh, just using this tool. So you can see that the these are the, the things that I added in the config file, because I only want two points in this case, the head and, and the head top and the neck. So I can just say, um, oh, do this plus, and then this is the, um, the head top. And then now we're looking at the neck, I can put it there. And then I can go to the next frame and kind of do this process for, um, 
how many ever frames. Usually, you don't need to do that many frames for for deep lap cut. Um, in total, across all your videos, if you annotate like let's say two hundred frames for your final version, that that works pretty well for for testing purposes. Like right now, if 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 you guys are gonna work on this, um, you could even just do like I don't know twenty frames and and see how that works. And I'm just going through quickly, but you want to make sure that you're you're annotating the same point, so you're not confusing the model. And if something is, um, um, let's say there's some occlusion, then you don't want to annotate that because it's it's being occluded and the model can't see it. So you don't want to confuse the model. So you want to be as consistent in these points, which I am not being at the moment. But anyway, I'll just stop here. So I'll save, Control S, you can save it. Um, and you could go through the trainee. And then once you've done your labeling, this next step, create training set. This you only want to do where you're actually going to run your model training. So in our case, it's going to be on Google Colab. So um, uh, what you can do is you can exit this thing, quit um, after the labeling process. And then um, you know that it's created this project folder on your desktop, as we saw initially. And within this project folder now in label data, it's going to have all these, these, these frames that I uh, extracted. And uh, also the, this, this file inside the label data, this collected data called CSV, this is gonna have um, basically um, um, whatever I just annotated, just the coordinates, the fly head top, the fly head top, and the fly neck, the X and Y coordinates for each point. So um, um, yeah, so what you can do is uh, you go to Google Colab and then well, you can upload this whole folder on your desktop or wherever it's created this project folder, um, basically that whole deep lab cut folder to um, the project folder, not, not the deep lab cut installation. The, this is the project folder. You can upload it to your Google Drive and then we can access it on Colab um, from there. Um, so this Colab notebook is, is, is linked. Uh, I just I just sent it um, to Adi, and then you can import your uh, your drive this way um, using these these two commands, and this just links your Google Drive to um, uh, Google Colab, so you can access your Google Drive files. Um, so let's say mounting, and then it'll ask you to log in, um, and then you can run through the uh, and then you also want to install uh, Deep Lab Card on the Colab instance, but this doesn't have to be the one with the GUI. This can just be the headless version. So I'm not going to do this now, but um, yeah. So you uh, can just say TF instead of TF uh, GUI, um, and that just installs Deep Lab Cut, but without the uh, without the GUI options. Um, and then uh, on your Google Drive, uh, so this the name of this folder will be different. It'll be like whatever the name of your folder is, but you will be able to access your Google Drive files by just doing like LS, um, content drive and my drive. And then you'll see the folder in there that you just uploaded. Um, and then uh, and then these remaining steps are also on that guide. So, so this is where we stop the create. Uh, create we have a question? Yeah. It's, gonna... it's just, where are the data? Where are the photos? Yeah. So the so notebooks the are available in the same, sorry, go ahead. Uh, the data when you're, uh, when you were creating this um, project, um, I say create new project. Um, oh yeah, so there's an option over here. It says copy videos to project folder. So you want to select this. If you don't select that, um, and then and then you do your browse videos and stuff like that, right? So basically, when I do browse videos and then I select the the um, the, the folder, and then I, I select the video that I want, and then I say create. Oops. Okay, let's say test three or test 34, um, let's say create, new project created. And then now it's it's on my desktop. You can see this, the folder name. So uh, if I go back to my desktop, uh, so oh, not this one, test 34, yeah. So, oh, and over here, now you can see in the videos folder, it's copied the video because I selected that copy video. Uh, if I hadn't selected that, you would still see something here, but this would not be the actual video. This would just be like um, 
what's called a sim link, um, which is basically just like an, an icon, which when you click on will take you to the actual video, but it's not the actual video, but you want to copy it because uh, you want to upload this whole folder, um, this whole folder to your Google Drive and you want the, the Google Drive, you, you want the video to actually be there um, so that the model can do the training. So yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Uh, and yeah, once you upload the, the folder and then um, the step that we, because all of the steps that I showed you, like including creating label data and like extract frames and stuff, they all have, you could either do it using the, the GUI or you could do it using the command line. And the way you do it using the command line is just in Python, you would say import deep lab cut. And then you can say like um, whatever, there's stuff on the guide, but it's basically like deep lab cut dot extract frames or deep lab cut dot um, um, label data. But label data won't work on Google Colab because it needs it needs to show that that GUI in order for you to click the points. And that, that's why I, that's why I said like you need to install it on your computer, do that, and then move the thing to um, Google Colab for training on the GPU. Um, if you don't want to train on the GPU, you can do these same steps on your computer, and it'll just take longer. It'll just train on the CPU. Um, but yeah. Um, on, on all of these commands, basically, it's very simple. It's just like the first the first thing is just going to be the location of the config file that we saw, which is in that folder. There's that YAML file, the config.yaml. And then, um, yeah, there's more details on this in the uh, in, in the guide. So you do create training, uh, create training data set um, and then train network. And that'll just, again, this is the same config file. And then this will just like go through and... Um, It'll it'll run and um, yeah it it so this is the guide basically um, and yeah they say the same commands like instead of the the create new project this is what I did with the with the GUI where I just clicked on create new project you can do the same things using the terminal by saying the name of the project and the location of the videos and then you can add more videos um, you can add more videos whenever. And then this is the config.yaml file. They just give you some list of important things that you can change if you want, which are like, for example, I changed the body parts to just say head, top, and neck, and you can change that. And um, yeah, the extract frames thing, uh, uniform or k-means, as I was talking about, these are just the command line versions of the same things. And um, yeah, they talk about the label frames, which creates that GUI for you to click. And then the uh, create training set. Somewhere along this line, um, I think after you do the create training set, it creates this additional file because because uh, called pose config.yaml, and this file has more of the um, things that are specific to the network itself, to the model, which uh, which includes like the type of model that's using, things ResNet fifty, like the uh, number of iterations that the model should run for. Uh, the, the how often you want to save those those wake files, um, the learning rate and stuff like that, and you can you can uh, leave these unchanged or you can uh, change the save iters and the display iters just just for your um, kind of purposes. If you just wanted to run for a thousand iterations and stop there, you can just say save iters is like I don't know save every hundred iterations or something and just like manually stop the the, the model, and then yeah, so you can stop the training whenever. Um, and save those weights, and um, yeah, and then once you've once you've done that, once you've trained it uh, for however long you wish, um, you can um, evaluate. You can just run this evaluate network that'll print out some metrics, and then given a new unseen um, video that you want to analyze, you can just say deep app cut or analyze videos, and then you given the same config file path, and then the name of the 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 location of the new video. And this will just take your trained model, and it'll it'll take a while. It'll run it on the on the new video, and um, they also have an option to save that as as an additional uh, as a kind of uh, uh, an output video. So create labeled videos, yeah. So it'll it'll take those predictions on this new video, and it'll just save it as a um, MP4 file, and then you can just play that and look at it. So. Yeah, so I would say don't worry too much about the the parameters. Um, it doesn't really matter that much, except for changing like how often you want to save it, how often you want to display it. Um, you don't really need to play or necessarily play around with the learning rate and stuff like that. You can if you want, but it's not really uh, necessary. 
uh, the, the, the default parameters work uh, pretty well. And you want to do, um, yeah, you could certainly try to do just like 20 frames, see how that goes for your final, uh, like for the fly head tracker thing. I think I annotated like 200 frames or 300 frames in total across like many videos. So in the config.yaml file, the initial file, you can kind of say how many frames you want to extract from each video. And um, then, yeah, obviously the based on the videos that you select when you're creating the project and um, the videos that you add, you can choose which videos you want. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, that was a lot to, to cover. I have to go now, but um, yeah, I hope this was uh, useful. And uh, um, yeah, I think, yeah, you just definitely want to think, spend some time thinking about the, your how you want to create your training validation and test splits, uh, irrespective of the task, whether it's deep lab card or whatever. And then following the deep lab card, if you want to do something deep lab card related is, is pretty straightforward after once you get it installed. Um, and uh, yeah, um, you can, I won't, I won't, I won't be available for the next hour, but you can leave me a message on Slack. And if, if you have any um, trouble with installation or stuff, and I can, I can try to help. Um, all right. Thank you, everyone.